133 on Tuesday, April 9th. Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Healthcare Commission meeting. Appreciate your being here, uh, either virtually or in person. Uh, also appreciate uh, Director Conroy and the entire CAPER staff for again graciously hosting us here in the room. It's always nice to have a, an official place of business, especially with the spread that they provide. Uh, so appreciate everybody's willingness to accommodate us. Um, we'll go ahead and take roll. I know at least one of our legislative friends uh, is planning to join virtually. I think the other one might be as well. Uh, so with that, I'll just kind of note who's in the room. We have Commissioner Schmidt, Commissioner Deccan, Commissioner Kane, Commissioner Hensley, and the chair. Uh, Commissioner McGinn, are you online? Not seeing and not hearing. Uh, Commissioner Landwehr, are you online? Yes. Very good. We will uh, note you present and we will monitor for Commissioner McGinn. If I can get a thumbs up, if she does join, that would be helpful. Oops. All right. Uh, first order of business is item one in your book is the approval of minutes from February 16th. Uh, this material should have been sent to the commission last week. Any updates? I move the minutes to be approved as presented. Is your mic on, Commissioner? Yes. Okay. All right. We have a motion. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Kane. I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or conversation? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Minutes are approved. All righty. We will move on to uh, tab two in our books, Commissioners. Uh, we have a few RFPs to get through today. Um, so we're going to start with the dental plan administration contract. And I believe Director Flory is going to walk us through this. So if we can get to that slide on the virtual screen, then we can get moving. Director? Move to the next one, Pete. Um, the dental benefit, our dental plan is a self-funded plan and we hire a third party administrator that provides services such as a network. Uh, they provide the dental benefits to our employees that include diagnostic preventative services as well as basic and major restorative services, orthodontia and implant coverage. On the next slide. Um, the contract we currently have with Delta Dental expires on December 31st. Um, we did release um, a new RFP. There are, currently, we have under our dental contract approximately 46,000 covered employees and their families under the self-funded plan. Um, Siegel was asked to assist in the review of this RFP by evaluating the financial components. Um, this included a repricing exercise based upon our actual claim file experience. Uh, the vendors do sign a confidentiality agreement in order to participate in the repricing agreement. And it looks at their fees, their discounts, um, their network penetration and the cost impact to both the self-funded plan as well as to the members. Um, our proposals assume a start date of January 1st, 2025. Next slide, Pete. We did receive three bids, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas, Delta Dental of Kansas, and SkyGen USA. All three vendors were invited to finalist meetings um, where we reviewed their information and had a discussion about their bids and their pricing. Next slide. Um, we looked at their capacity to administer our program, the breadth of their network, their claims processing, uh, the customer service they would be providing to both the members as well as to the plan, as well as their reporting capabilities. Next slide. Um, services included include that network, um, claims administrating, reporting. Uh, they do have to have a member portal, uh, a, a portal for the state employee health plan. They provide member communications, ID cards, and benefit booklets. And this is our famous KDOT map, and we just show this to remind you of the areas. Uh, we do divide the state up into six areas to review the network because it allows us to better see the vendor's penetration than, say, using GeoAxis, which can be very uh, distorted, particularly in a rural area. So as we look at the networks on the next slide, 
you'll see that uh, Blue Cross has a, a wide network, as does Delta Dental. And SkyGen is a new vendor in this area, and they actually rent their network. And you can see that it is significantly smaller than the other two. Both Blue Cross and Delta offer a PPO network, as well as then a Premier network. And the Premier is a larger network. Uh, the PPO tends to be the discount network, and they offer both of those. Uh, SkyGen does not offer two networks. They only have the one. Next slide. So in looking at the fees that they have bid, uh, they bid a per employee per month administrative fee, and you'll notice that uh, SkyGen's fee is higher. Um, part of that is because they are renting that network, as well as the fact that they would be charging us a fee for implementation. So that's why you'll notice that their fee does differ. And you can see the fee on a monthly, annual, and three-year basis shown on the slides. This does assume the contract for 25, 26, and 2027. Next slide. Some additional costs that we always like to know and find out, you know, what kind of programming fees we might be charged and, you know, what would be the fees to obtain uh, files into our data warehouse? What if we need to modify those file layouts to obtain additional information? So each one of the vendors did provide a response on, on what fees they might charge for those additional services. Next slide. We asked them about what credits. Um, it isn't uncommon for a new vendor to offer a credit to the plan that we can use to help offset costs should the plan be moving to a new vendor. There are costs inherent in doing that. Blue Cross is offering us a $200,000 implementation credit. Delta Dental is our current vendor, and so there would be no implementation, and SkyGen did not include one. Um, in addition, under the annual communications, Blue, uh, Delta Dental has offered a $5,000 credit to use towards the cost of member communications, such as we do a video for our, our website on each one of the plans, and that money could be used to produce that video that explains the coverage of our dental program. On the next slide, um, this is the slide that um, Siegel helped put together that shows a summary of their evaluation of the discounts available based upon that claims review. Um, the second bullet point shows you again the fees for that annual administrative cost that we would pay um, and then other projected costs. And that is footnoted there at the bottom of the slide on Blue Cross that there are some fees that would be associated with that particular bid. And then um, the total three-year projected cost. Now, you'll notice here that um, when you look at SkyGen, their total projected cost is lower. And that is because their network is significantly smaller. And as a result, more of the claims are going to land in the non-network bucket. And that's going to push additional expense onto employees. Um, so that is one of the reasons why you'll see that that cost there is smaller. Uh, Gina, did you have anything that you would like to add on this slide? Um, if you'd go to the mic. I think you did a good job of explaining it. That's. Real, I'm sorry, real quick. If you can introduce yourself, please. For I'm the sorry. I'm Gina Sander with Siegel. Thank you. Do, does anyone have any questions for Gina while we're on this slide? I think it might be helpful to go ahead and round out the okay. next two slides and then we can come back for questions. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, on the next slide, um, Gina had put together some information on the impact of the balance billing and I'm gonna let Gina explain this one. Okay, so when, when providers are asked to join a network, they agree to a certain set of reimbursements, whether it's a fee schedule or discount off uh, eligible charges. And if they're, they don't want to join the network, they, they don't agree to those charges. So when, when a provider is in the network and a member goes to that provider, they have agreed to accept the reimbursement for that level of benefit and there is no balance billing. But if they are not in the network, then the provider 
will bill the additional amount between what he is reimbursed, which is usually and clearly here at a lower level. Uh, in this case with SkyGen, they used one of their fee schedules as the basis for reimbursing the providers from one of their networks as their reimbursement basis. And it's a low reimbursement level, so there's a good amount of space between the submitted eligible charges and what they get reimbursed, and that will get balance billed to the member. So that's why you see the cost to the plan being low because they have a lot of out-of-network providers being reimbursed at a low level. And then that extra additional balance billing has the potential to be passed on to the member, and that is at each provider's discretion. You want the next slide? Sure. So we'll go to the next slide, page 23. So this uh, illustrates the potential exposure to balance billing that would occur with each of these vendors. And Blue Cross Blue Shield and Delta Dental have a significant network. So there's very little balance billing being passed on, but SkyGen has so few providers in the state that there's the potential for additional balance billing. And you see, you see the bottom line here where it shows the network utilization mix, which is the percentage of claims flowing through in-network providers versus out-of-network providers. Very good, thank you for uh, that. So just to make sure I'm clear on my head, if we kind of, if we only looked at page 21, we would be seeing what we feel would be the cost to the plan. Correct. Uh, in its entirety based on network providers. However, uh, because there's a, a, a large potential for a large balance billing passed on to uh, our members to get the true cost across the entirety of the plan, both to the plan and then to the members potentially, we would add slides 21 and 23 together. Is that a way of thinking of it? 21 is what we expect the plan to, to be. That would be a worst case scenario because this is, it would be at the discretion of the, right. of the vendor. But okay. even if 50% of them decided not to pass along the cost, you'd still have a huge amount passed along. I guess to say it differently though, if we added those numbers, so we, page 21 is not representative of the total cost of dental in Kansas specific to SkyGen. That These are the, paid costs, you know, no, right. This is this is plan paid cost on page 21. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner, is any questions about anything in this portion? I have one. Commissioner Deccan. The projected costs for any of the, the providers, but especially for, for SkyGen, how did you come up with I'm looking at on page 23. How did you come up with those? So we we used the projections for your, den, your current dental projections based on your current experience. And then we applied the results from the repricing analysis, which also indicated to us how much, how, how much of the claim dollars were flowing through providers that were in network versus out of network. So we took your experience, we applied the discount information to your experience for Blue Cross, for Delta, and for SkyGen. And because SkyGen had so few providers, the application of the discounts went to a much lower percentage of your claims, impacted a much lower, and this is the difference from what your baseline discounts are now. And so the out-of-network piece of this they had estimated how much uh, it, it flows through as, as how much the plan would pay for out of network, which was very much lower because of the lower reimbursement. So there's much fewer claims flowing through out of network providers for Blue Cross and Delta Dental, and they reimburse at a low dollar amount also 
but because most of their dollars flow through providers in network, you're not getting the lower reimbursements to the providers. Whereas SkyGen has the lower. So you'd get you'd get more member noise because they would have a more difficult time finding a provider that's in the network. Thank you. Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back to page 14. And on that, it's called, it's a bit evaluation page. And um, so, you know, what the information we have in our packets today um, address the vendor network um, and, and address a little bit of the claims processing, but um, only in the dollar amount, not in the, um, like, clean claims and, and uh, trouble with things. Uh, is there is there any type of, um, I mean, it says that the bid was evaluated on these six things. On the remaining four or five things, like what about the capacity to administer the program? Are those the same for all three? Are those different? Um, customer service for members, do we have customer, do we have feedback from our members on, uh, have they had issues with the current vendor? Um, services to SEHP staff, has staff had, I mean, what what do these other boxes mean? Because we don't really have any information about the bids on these other boxes. Sure. And Director Flory, is there anything high level uh, anecdotes yes. or, or data that you can provide for this? Yes. So in the bid, the vendors are requested um, to answer questions regarding all of those things. Uh, we require certain customer service hours. We ask questions about turnover in customer service. We ask them questions about their claims administration capacity, what percentage of that is electronic versus paper. Um, we ask about their error rates. We ask them about a variety of different things around claims. Um, we get sample reports within the RFP, so we look at those as well. Um, with our current vendor, um, we have a very low amount of member dis questions or concerns that come into our office. Um, they have been our partner uh, for a number of years, and, and we don't receive a great deal of, of member uh, concern about their handling of dental services. Uh, staff has a good working relationship with them. They submit their uh, billings timely. They submit their performance guarantees timely. So we do evaluate those things um, that are listed in the boxes. Is it fair to say that uh, some of the larger differences are what make the packet in here as it relates to uh, what the commission might be voting on? That's uh, knowing that some of that might be subjective in the eyes of the commission, but uh, as it relates to the other four boxes, most of them are largely uh, meeting the objectives set forth by the RFP. Yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Schmidt? And then um, on the... Um, um on the page 16, the KDOT map, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, is there a key to that? What I don't know, have any idea what those dots mean. Those are just cities within those counties. It's a difference in the blue and the green dots. Oh, I don't know. Um, like I said, we use it more as a regional map. So we're looking at the big picture, the big colored areas, like the one, two, three, four, five, and six, just to divide the state up. It kind of gives us a way to better visualize um, our membership. And when you look then on the next page, you can see that we've told you in each one of those regions how many employees we have and then how, what the network access in that given area is. So it's, it's just a way that we've used that we found works well to divide the state up and be able to visualize uh, member access. Well, I thought maybe the blue dots were, since the next page had Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas blue and the Delta Dental as, as green, I thought maybe those dots related to that. So. Um, because there's no key or anything on that. Yeah, it's it's a KDOT map, and the, that may be a, something that KDOT uses, but we just use it for the large colored chunks as opposed to the individual city information. And then, Mr. Chairman, on page 18, um, where it says uh, the uh, uh, PEPM administration fee for each of the three companies includes network access and will remain flat, what does that mean that the administration fee includes network access? So these administration fees include network access fees and 
uh, SkyGen also said they rolled their implementation charge into that fee also. But um, Blue Cross and Delta own their networks, so there's not there's not a network access fee, but SkyGen leases their networks and there is a network access fee in their pricing. So, so maybe that should have said the uh, administration fee for SkyGen includes network access because the other two don't include network access? They didn't specifically list it out separately and SkyGen did. Okay, because that makes me think that there's Anyway, okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Commissioner Landwehr, I want to make sure you have an opportunity just in case I'm not hearing you. I'm fine, thank you. Very good. Commissioner Kane, you have a look on your face. <laughs> it, would it be acceptable to make a motion? I think that that would be in order. Okay. I would like to make a motion to move forward with Delta Dental of Kansas. Okay. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second, second Commissioner Schmidt. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll do roll call vote. Commissioner Schmidt? Aye, but at the proper time, I'd like to explain my vote. Very good. Commissioner Deccan? Aye. Commissioner Hensley? Aye. Commissioner Kane? Aye. Commissioner Landwehr? Commissioner Landwehr, if you're uh, voting, you're on mute. Aye. Hello? Seven, aye. Yes, ma'am. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Uh, motion carries. Commissioner Schmidt, would you like to explain your vote? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would. Um, I, I am voting aye on this. I am voting yes for this based on the information that we currently have available. But I do want to be recorded that I still believe the process could be improved. And, you know, we don't really have a lot of input. We don't have any input once the uh, bids are received and, and prior to making a, a decision other than what we're provided here. And um, I, I would continue to hope that we'll have more information as we continue to bid, Think as we continue to award. Thank you. Uh, noted, we will make sure that your comments are accurately and appropriately reflected in the minutes. I would also note that the packets do go out about a week in advance of the meetings. So if there are any questions at any point in time with any of the materials, the team is more than happy to provide follow-up information and, and more information if we have specific requests that can be handled through uh, this process to make it a little bit more transparent, a little bit better. All right, moving on to action item three, prescription eyewear insurance contract. This is going to be another RFP review. Uh, it's going to be in tab three in your notebooks. And Director Flory, I will let you take this away. Next slide, Pete. So the voluntary eyewear um, coverage is a fully insured product that provides coverage for members' eyeglasses, lenses and contact lenses. The benefits do include coverage for a routine eye exam for members that are not enrolled in our medical benefit, or if you're a direct bill Medicare member with Medicare, and Medicare doesn't always cover a routine eye exam, it would be eligible under this program. We, we are distinguishing this because if a member has an eye um, disease or an injury, those services are covered under the medical plan rather than this benefit. This benefit is really about hardware. It's about eyeglasses, lenses, and contact lenses. So on the next slide, uh, the current vendor we have for this benefit is Avesis and their contract will end on December 31st. Uh, right now, the active employee enrollment, we have 32,388. Of those, 9,077 are enrolled in BASIC, 23,311 are enrolled in the Enhanced Plan. We also have a number of direct bill members. Uh, direct bill members, we have 5,621. A thousand of those, a little over, have the BASIC plan, and 4,619 are enrolled in the Enhanced Plan. Um, this is a fully insured plan and the employee pays the full cost of this coverage. Um, we will go over the premiums on, on a future slide, and the vendor will take effect with this new benefit contract for three years on January 1st. 
So on the next slide, we just have for your information, some additional information about uh, the enrollment in the eyewear benefit. Um, it is currently uh, at 32,388 and you can see the coverage, um, the active is in the yellow um, with the basic, the kind of a bittersweet orange is the active enhanced plan. Our direct bill members are shown in the um, blue shades, um, kind of a light blue and kind of a gray blue at the bottom. So on the next slide, we did put this out for bid and we did receive two bidders. Um, Avesis is our current bidder. Assurancy uh, previously had provided this benefit. Uh, both of these vendors were invited in for a discussion about their bids and we did request their best and finals following those meetings. In our review of the bids on the next slide, we looked at their experience with providing a voluntary prescription eyewear benefit, uh, their provider networks, their premium costs, their ability to provide customer service, um, and their reporting capabilities. So on the next slide, some of the services that are included are access to a network. Uh, they do, this is fully insured, so they are fully responsible for all of the claims processing and payments. Uh, they're responsible for reporting. They do have to have a member portal as well as provide a portal for us as well at the benefit office. Uh, would they do member communications, ID cards, and they are required to provide an insurance booklet to the membership. Again, on the next slide, you're going to see the famous KDOT map. And again, the colored regions are what we're, we're going for here, the one, two, three, four, five, and six, just to break the state up. On the next slide, we have a network comparison. Again, uh, you will see the areas are listed on the far left. And we show you the number of chains and independents included in each one of these networks. So both of these vendors have uh, networks that have capacity for our product. On the next slide, we have the premiums. Again, this is a fully insured contract. So you will see uh, for each of the coverage tiers, employee only, employee spouse, employee children and family. We've shown you then the number of people that have selected each one of those, whether they were active or direct bill. Then in the next column, we show you what the current rates are that we have with Avesis. In the dark orange, we'll show you the bid from Avesis. This is their best and final bid. And then in the gold, you will see the assurancy bid. Now down below on the enhanced plan, you'll notice that there's a an extra column out there that says surency alternative plan. So they did bid an alternative benefit option for the enhanced program that the commission may consider if they would prefer that to what we currently are offering. So we will go in a little more detail on that. Um, so on the next slide, we have the alternative enhanced plan option for progressive lenses. So this is the alternative benefit for the enhanced program. And you can see for each one of the progressive types of coverage tiers, um, what the average retail cost is. And those retail costs come from IMED. IMED is Surancy's partner in providing this benefit. And then you'll see in the middle column what the current benefit is. It's $165 allowance, plus there's a $25 material fee. You can see how that works out. And then on the far right, you'll see how that benefit would have flowed if we had the current surancy proposed progressive lens benefit. The other benefits under the enhanced plan remain the same, but this is an enhancement that the commission can consider. And as you noticed on the prior page, the difference in rates between the current surancy plan and the surancy alternative plan are very, very small. It's, it's within a few cents here or there for these different options. So that's another option that the commission can consider. Um, we did ask each one of the vendors on the next slide. We asked each one of them to provide us um, information about any additional benefits they provided. This was their there's an opportunity to tell us about their plan and these are their words. So with Avesis, they do have um, an online eyewear shopping tool and they offer some additional discounts, refractive LASIK surgery, um, and members have a full year to use their contact lens 
allowance, which was a little different than some of the contracts we've had over the years where a member had to buy all their contracts at, contact lenses at one time. Um, Avesis does not require that. Then on the next slide, again, we did the same thing for Surancy. We asked them to provide us some additional details about some additional benefits a member might get. Um, they have the ability to, again, use that contact lens benefit and the frame allowance in the same year. And that's, that's a pretty interesting benefit because typically for a contact lens wearer, if they get contact lenses, then they don't get any benefit towards the cost of a pair of eyeglasses. And with Surancy, they do get to still use that frame allowance. So that's a little extra benefit. Um, they do have some enhanced lens options, um, discounts, they offer Lasix, um, and they do have access to both glasses.coms and contact lens direct with the Surancy program. So with that, we're open to questions. Very good, thank you. Um, I do have a few questions myself. On page 31, the services included, uh, specifically the member portal. I'll give you a moment to get there on the top right. I meant to ask this on the last bid and I, I neglected to. The member portal is specific to the, the vendor. They each have their own member portal. However, they do provide, we have the ability to link it on our map. So our members can go just to their map and then hyperlink out into the other portal. Is that correct? Um, so that is a differentiator. That's a good point to bring up. So we have on, under the membership administrative portal, which we call map, from there you can do single sign on. There's a link on there to single sign on into our vendors um, portals. With Delta Dental, um, we currently do that, and, and previously when we had Surancy, we were able to do that. Um, Avesis at this time does not have that capability, and that is something that we did ask them to provide us with a performance guarantee that if we went with them, that they would be able to get that single sign-on from the membership administrative portal in place. And you said Surancy does have that capability today, and Avesis does not yet, but they're they have a performance guarantee against that should we move forward with them? Yes. Okay. On page uh, 34 with the uh, monthly premium cost, the first two columns with the stars and then the orange and the golden rod there, mm -hmm. are those apples to apples on the PEPM in terms of what's included, what their costing is based off of? They had to, yes, those are the ex bidding on the contracts as they exist today and then the Bottom one is the alternative. But the, the first two are apples to apples. They're yes. both uh, on the RFP as it was posted. Yes. So then the alternative plan, we see assurance costing in there. Both, all vendors who chose to submit uh, a response to the RFP had an opportunity to provide an alternative plan. Is that correct? Yes. And assurance chose to provide that as an option for us should we choose to go down that path and yes. Visas did not. Correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions? Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know when we went to Avisus, uh, they ended up, um, they they had a guarantee last time of a certain amount of net, uh, certain amount of providers in network and before the uh, contract actually even uh, before January 1st of the effective date of the contract and they were not able to meet th their um, proposals. And so I know we, uh, the contract did have performance um, penalties in it, I guess, is what you'd say, instead of guarantees, uh, there were penalties. And so um, did they propose that same um, same thought this time that they would, is, is, there a, is, is there a penalty for lack of network adequacy in either one, for either one of these uh, bidders? Yeah, Director Flory, what about the performance guarantees? So in the performance guarantees, since both of these currently have a network, which is adequate. We do have performance guarantees that they maintain that network and that they will provide uh, annual reporting to show and if in any of those areas the network decreases they are required to notify us as well as they can be subject to performance guarantees a penalty because they drop their network in a certain territory within the state. Very good. And is there a, uh, a time certain by which they would need to cure that to get better and, and get back to their adequate network? I don't believe that it currently has a time guarantee that says that they have to enhance it by a certain date, 
but if it continues to be low, below the required amount, they would continue to be penalized each quarter. Okay. Very good. Commissioner Schmidt, Mr. follow Chairman. up. Oh, one moment, uh, Commissioner Lanware. We got Commissioner Schmidt still. Oh, okay, Commissioner Lanware. I apologize. Um, kind of along those lines then, so is the guarantee by region then, according to your, your KDOT map? Yes. <clears throat> And so where are they deficient in? I don't believe that they are currently deficient. It is that if their network were to decrease and become deficient, then the penalties would start to apply. How much is that decrease? Do you remember, Paul? It's 5%. And did they, all right, thank you. Commissioner Kane. Thank you. I had a couple of questions. One is that Surency, you mentioned, Director Flory, about um, they could use the contact lens benefit and the frame allowance in the same plan year, and that's not mentioned for a visa. So does that mean they don't offer that? They do not offer that. Okay, and then I know that we had Surency in the past and was just curious if you noticed a difference in customer service or the level of complaints or issues that you had with either one? With Surency, we had very few members contact us with, with issues with regard to coverage. Um, with, as, as the commission may recall, that when Avisis came on board, there were an, a number of inquiries um, concerns expressed about the network um, and so we did have more member contact initially I think as the contract has gone along that has subsided um, substantially and and I think the numbers show that employees are able to use the benefit because we have seen that the number of members taking the benefit from the first year to, to today has has increased thank you Commissioner Schmidt. Yeah, I want to follow up on that a little bit. On the um, on the previous bid uh, for the dental contract, I know you had a box for customer service for members, and that's not on this one. But I, I was going to voice that um, I know that I, as a as a member, received several complaints from employees on on um, a visa, um, especially when we first started. But I'm not sure that is. Um, I mean, th th I still have complaints about um, the network. Um, and I wanted to say that uh, I think that this the Surrency alternative plan um, is an incredible plan, especially for uh, any employee or family member that's uh, over the age of like 40 or so uh, with the progressive <laughs> lenses. Um, I think that it, I, I am really excited that they chose to bid like that uh because the the member the proposed member cost is you know on a premium tier three is 115 dollars in savings um over over their uh over what they bid in the apples to apples uh thing so um when you're ready i would love to make a motion any other comments or questions uh, yeah commissioner deccan I can't hear him. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, what I was asking is whether was there was any uh, computation on on savings that, uh, that could occur, much like we saw in the dental, where there's a, a good deal more expense with with one provider uh, than there were with the others. Um, there was not because. With the current plan, I'm not sure that we have all the information. So the progressive type, whether it's a standard or a, a tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, that's really kind of a surency IMED tiering system. So I don't think that we really have the ability to, 
to monetize that other than what's shown there on slide 35 in the center where it shows you for an individual based on the type of progressive they selected, uh, how much that would cost them. But as far as knowing today with visas, how many of our employees would have fallen within those tiers set out by, by IMED, I don't think we have the ability to, to do that. Should we choose sure and see? I'd be interested in, in if, if there's a way to, and after the fact, um, we can follow know up what kind them. of impact that may have had. Should, should that be where our choice? Yeah, I, I think one thing that we can commit to, um, speaking my secretary of administration had on is, you know, whatever direction we go, we're always more than happy to provide any reporting or financials as it relates to any of the plans that we discussed, not just this one. If there's any questions, as long as we have enough lead time to get the data together and pull reporting and metrics, either we can handle it in-house, we're going to have uh, Siegel, our consultants, help us with that. So if there's any, uh, please bring a level of specificity uh, with any requests, but we're happy to pull anything that we can. So any other comments before we move to motions? Okay, Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move that we award uh, Surrency the three-year plan using the or th three-year uh, contract using the Surrency alternative plan. All right, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Deccan. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt. Aye. Commissioner Deccan. Aye. Commissioner Hensley. Aye. Commissioner Kane. Aye. Commissioner McGinn, you're not on yet, are you? Okay. Commissioner Laneweir. Aye. All right. Motion carries. Right. Moving on to action item four, and actually I'll make a note that um, to the extent possible at the earliest possible HCC meeting in plan year 25, we'll start some reporting metrics as to what tiers uh, we're seeing utilization for the uh, prescription hour coverage. So we're gonna move on to agenda item four, uh, the employee advisory committee uh, discussion. Uh, commissioners, again, uh, you had information sent to you last week. There's quite a bit of information in here. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to review and at least get a pre-read. We're going to have um, the EAC come up and, and request action on membership to approve that for this year uh, and also some bylaw changes. So with that, I believe we have uh, Adam Noble here. Uh, so if you can uh, introduce yourself and the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam Noble and I'm uh, employed currently uh, with the Kansas Judicial Branch. Sorry to interrupt. Can you make sure that you're a little closer to those mics or online folks in here? Thank you. Sorry about that. My name is Adam Noble and I'm the current EAC president. I'm with the Kansas Judicial Branch and Office of Judicial Administration. Um, and I have two action items to cover, as you mentioned, uh, within the EAC. Uh, I'm first going to cover the bylaws. So our subcommittee has recommended two amendments to the current EAC bylaws. There is an amendment to Article 3, Membership uh, Section 1A, direct bill members. We are shifting from three members to two. Uh, you can sh uh, refer to Membo uh, Number 2 pertaining to the bylaws. Uh, this will shift the number of retirees from three to two members on the committee. The uh, second portion within the bylaws is an amendment to Article 3, Membership Section 1C, extending the term of the appointment from a three-year term to a four-year term. <laughs> This change will apply to all new members of the EAC appointed after January 1st of 2024. Uh, I will then now segue into membership. Uh, the membership subcommittee has now. Actually, if we can, sorry, I'm going to, if we can just pause and take these one at a time. I'm sorry. Uh, you're ahead. fine. You're fine. Um, uh, so, commissioners, that was page 41, I believe, and 42 in your books, uh, talking about the membership changes. Uh, again, uh, a change to the number of direct bill and then a change to the number of uh, years on the terms. Any questions or comments or discussion on that, yeah, Commissioner Schmidt? What's the rationale, Vicki Schmidt, what's the rationale for going from three to four years? Um, I think we were trying to give the ability for our uh, our volunteers of this committee to serve a little bit longer because there's still currently a three-year term limit. Um, it's been harder to find more applicants for the committee to fill. So it was kind of, I believe, our efforts to try and sustain who we have. Um, it's just been a lost some applicants, I believe, so. So you, but you would be going from a, a nine year total term to a 12 year total term, correct? Correct. And then, uh, may, I, may I? Yeah, please continue. Okay, and then um, I was wondering, I know that um, on page 44, um, I assume these are your current, um, or 
the current ones or what what is page, page 43 and 44 Let me shift to 44 so i can look at that oh so that's uh there we are you're looking at uh like is this your current bylaws i believe so yes uh so okay. the revision date of february 2020 i believe is the current posted okay. So, so my qu question is, um, on the uh, um, on page 44, on the conflict of interest, mm -hmm. um, to avoid conflicts of interest uh, between members of the commission and the committee, active employees who directly report to or supervise members of the commission shall not be members of the committee. And uh, I, I understand that conflict of interest, and I, I support that conflict of interest, but um, there isn't uh, there isn't a spot if you will for anybody that that does work for an elected official uh okay. in on that and and i i know that i have had employees apply oh. and it they're not even responded to that they I, mean, I know they can't be a direct report to me but i have many employees that only have uh seven direct reports sure. out of 125 so i I know that we have had employees that aren't direct reports to me and they don't even get like a thank you for submitting your application. I wasn't even aware of that. So, I mean, the way I feel is if you're interested in serving this and you have the passion to do that, I mean, the more the better, but I don't know with, with the change of the bylaws, I can definitely take that to our subcommittee and, and look at addressing that. I don't have to see who all I have to get involved, but I mean, yeah. I, I, I would like to at least suggest that. And the last thing I have is that, um, and, Mr. Chairman, this is a question for you. Um, I didn't see a change in this, but I don't think, do we have a division of healthcare finance anymore? Within KDHE? Yeah. We do. Well, um, their their name is um, on, on, their, on page 43, the very first paragraph talks about DHCF, and so does um, page 44 under selection of members. And I just, because when I think it was just missed when the transfer took place. I would agree. So we will, uh, if the commission is okay with it, do some cleanup to ensure that, you know, uh, when the transfer over to the Department of Administration was made, we can call it the uh, SEHPP, Division of SEHPP. Thank you for the catch. Any other, yeah, Commissioner Deccan. This is Steve Deccan. Uh, Explain to us the rationale for decreasing the number of retiree members of the commission. Right. So um, we've also had issues, I believe, kind of filling. The, it's, it's harder for retirees to fill in that because, unfortunately, um, if you're not serving as an active member, it's you don't really get compensated really to travel. And then depending on your location, if we're trying to have it here in Topeka, it, it can make it more difficult. Uh, covering this, like we stated before, the, the lower amount of applicants, it just kind of goes with. And it's been really hard to fill that. We're doing our best to try to reflect what what the uh, bylaws say about keeping it spread out and in equal representation but unfortunately i think it's just been much more difficult to fill that that third slot so it was not an intent to slight that portion of it but it's just trying to keep the amount of representation available what sort of uh percentage of vacancy have you had in those three positions over the last couple of years well, uh, to be honest, this is only like my second year, my first term, so I'm still kind of on a learning curve. So, uh, if and, and, and what were you absent the meetings that they elected the chair? Uh, that, that's meant to be funny. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, you're all right. Uh, what can you What can you say to that question? Um, I know that I'm, I'm also on the membership subcommittee. We're trying to look more into that. Um, there's been a lot of changes, I think, in here. We're trying to kind of get a good baseline within this committee and, and good, good practices moving forward. So um, I don't want to misrepresent or misinform, so I'm not entirely 100% certain, but I, I will definitely try to get down to that and, and give you a better answer when I when I get the chance to find it. I can identify uh, with the, the commitment uh, by a, a retired person, since there's not the the benefit of, of probably official leave time to, to to travel as well as being paid for that time, um, I have a little bit of a concern uh, because it does uh, retirees make up about a, a sixth or a seventh of the of the uh, uh, pool of people that that um, are covered by the state health insurance plan, and and three members happens to be about a seventh of 21. Right. Um, 
I have more of a concern, though, that I noticed that in addition to d changing the number, you also eliminate the requirement that one of those two retirees be a Medicare eligible retiree. Uh, am I, did I read anything or something? I may correctly? have missed that portion in here. Uh, you show me which, let's see. On the memo, the um, section that talks about uh, new language under Article 3, Section 1A, um, changes the number to two. Uh, that will be uh, who shall be covered by a state health care through direct billing due to their mm -hmm. prior employment. And that's it. Whereas currently it says of which two of the three shall be retired employees eligible for Medicare. Mm. I'd really, I, I, under, I can understand uh, the, the difficulty, um, but I think there's a, a clear enough distinction. I've, I've served on, on this body both as a non-Medicare eligible retiree and now as a, as a uh, Medicare eligible retiree. And, and there are different concerns that occurred during those those stages and not that it requires a person uh who who um is medicare eligible but i think it it at least brings that perspective right. uh to, to be voiced because there's a personal interest possibly in it right and i'd uh, i'd like for you to consider or this for this body to consider uh retaining that one of those two members be a medicare eligible person Okay. Uh, that probably doesn't help your concerns in terms of recruitment, but I think um, maybe it's uh, well, it's, it's what I it's a proposal I would make rather than making the change to uh, only direct bill, but rather keep one of those direct bill members as Medicare eligible. Okay. So if I can get a point of clarification from staff and uh, legal counsel, so the the action item before us, should we choose to as a commission, would be to either approve or not approve the changes to the employee advisory committee bylaws. That's that's correct statement. I'm getting head nods. So should we choose, we could uh, send this back to the EAC and ask them to review with the potential to add a Medicare a requirement for one of the two to be Medicare. Um, that's what I'm eligible. proposing, yes. But I just want to make sure we're, we're clear on the action item that we can do that. And then it would be deemed not approved at this meeting. Should we choose to do that? And they would go back as an EAC determine if they want to do that and then bring it back at the next meeting. Yeah, we got a lot of head nods. I just want to make sure we're clear on what steps are if we choose to go down that path. So to consider it, we'd have to not approve that particular change today. I think you could add the, the caveat that you're also recommending that they make that change that you're wanting to see. Right, okay. Make it make it a clear message. Any other, this, uh, Adam? Sorry, I uh, just want to clarify. I know it previously said two, so you're saying at least, at least one, is, is it a, I mean, I want to respect whichever choice it is you have. With the new language, changing the number of retiree members to from three to two, uh, I would like to continue seeing that. I guess currently it requires two of them to be retired or Medicare eligible. I would like for it to, to require one of the two, at least okay. one of the two to be Medicare eligible. At a minimum. Okay, Commissioner Schmidt. I don't want to, um, Vicki Schmidt, I don't want to muddy the water, but do you want them to be Medicare eligible or do you want them to be a Medicare supplement holder? I mean, that, that's different. People can be Medicare eligible and not be on a supplemental plan. I, I'm comfortable with Medicare eligible. That's what the current language states, correct? Um, yeah. Yes, it just simply says uh, shall be retired employees eligible for Medicare under the current language. So I'm, so, I'm comfortable and, and, with that language, but making it only one of the two uh, shall be well, eligible for Medicare. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Chairman, correct me if I'm wrong. So that that means you could be a retiree of the state, not I'll be on any any of the um, plans that we have to offer. No but you could be medicare eligible because that's what medicare eligible is uh can i clarify your language yeah, if calls we can... for the person to be a direct bill member yes. i think director flory's yes. got some yes they wisdom must be too. enrolled as a direct bill member um to be eligible to participate on the ac and they must have the medical coverage so that would be either a medicare supplement medicare advantage or being an early retiree covered under the active plan. So, Mr. Chairman, could you not be a direct bill member and have dental? 
I believe she said you have to have medical. You have to have medical to be a direct bill. Under these, yes, you have to have direct bill member with medical coverage to be serve, uh, considered for serving. Is what I'm hearing. It, so dental it would says not covered qualify. by a state health plan, and I'm just saying, isn't the dental plan as a, a part of our health plan offerings? I don't want to mince words, but I'm sorry. I want to make sure that we're doing what we say. I want to make sure we get it right. So I consider the dental plan or the vision plan part of our health plan. We need just one moment. We could, it sounds like we, well, not to get ahead of any motions or votes. Um, if we move down the path of sending this back to the EAC uh, to modify, we can ensure that there is language in there that states it needs to be a medical plan to be covered yeah. to ensure that it is somebody that's, if it is Medicare eligible or if it's just direct bill, uh, either one are included in the medical plans. Commissioner Schmidt. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the exact words are, but I think I, all I'm saying is that I, I, I want to make sure that we're doing what you, that we select um, what Commissioner DeCant, the words that Mr. DeCant um, would want to make sure that it happens. I, I, I just, if you put it, the Medicare supplement in there, wouldn't that be, um, or Medicare, anyway, I, I'll, I'll let the lawyers or whatever, the professionals figure that out. But thank you. I think just so um, I think you know what we're trying to say, just so we get the right language. Correct. I believe. Well, we uh, let's go ahead and formalize this with a motion, and we can work through the the details real quick. So, do you have a motion, Commissioner? Yes, I move that we approve the proposed amendment from the EAC related to length of terms which I believe, if I've got this right, is Article 3, Section 1C. Can I, do you want two separate motions, or do you want one? one we're Let's do two one. separate motions. Two separate? Yes, please. I'll stop with that. Okay, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Hensley. Discussion on the first motion, which is to approve the change in the term. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Do you have another motion, Commissioner? I do. Uh, I move that we send back to the EAC um, the item they recommend in regards to numbers of members, asking that they review and consider that in decreasing the number of retiree members down to two that they retain that one of those members using the correct language be a um, direct bill member covered by medical and eligible for Medicare. Okay, you've heard the motion. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Hensley, discussion on the motion. And if it's okay with the maker of the motion, uh, we will leave flexibility for legal staff and staff to clean this up in a manner that is going to be consistent with the bylaws. Certainly. Very good. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Noble, do you, uh, Commissioner Hensley? 
is uh, page 40. Is that the current membership? Uh, can we take it to page 40? Page 40. I have not seen this list myself. Yes. This is the list that of the current members. This looks right, yeah. Just out of curiosity, I noticed the person that has been appointed representing the Kansas Department of Aging and Disability works in Cass County and lives in Cass County. I didn't even know Cass was a county in Kansas. I think it's a county in Missouri. There is a Cass County, Missouri. I'm not familiar with all 105, to be honest with you, right off the top of my head. Do we have, <laughs> I'm assuming he is. <laughs> do we have a um, office of the KDADS in um, Cass County? I just, I'm curious about that. I, I'm honestly not certain. Um, I have to get back to you on that. That's, is that Tressie right there? Um, I'm wondering if that was maybe just where she resides and then she works within the state. I'm, well, a, I'm just looking at the column that is yep. in right, I see, I, county of work. Right, I, I see that. In both county of work and county of residence. This right. uh, warrants further review and consideration and we'll make sure that it's updated appropriately for the next meeting. Thank you for the catch, Commissioner. And then um, the guy at the bottom of the list, he lives in California. Can we scroll down? Says San Mateo, California. Yeah, he's a retiree. Oh, that's retiree. So I'm assuming he must be living out in California then. Yeah. But he's a retiree, so I don't he know. He worked for us then when he was working. working right. He's state. Right. So he's a retiree of the state. He just resides in California. So he remotely joins us. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Well, all righty, Mr. Noble. Yeah, my second item here was pertaining to membership. Uh, the membership subcommittee has vetted and submitted the, for approval the following new members. Joseph Coburn for the University of Kansas, Lori Scott Dryling, West Pittsburgh State University, Melissa Marish, with the Department of Children and Families, Sarah Myers, Miles, I'm sorry, with the Department of Education and within the Regents, Cassandra Steele within Judicial Administration, and Michelle Huntsman with Department of Administration. In addition, the EAC would appoint the following, uh, reappoint the following uh, nominees to serve on the uh, EAC, it would be Drew Campbell with Department of Administration, Warren Weeb with the Kansas Board of Healing Arts, and Mike Mercer with the Emporia State University. Your terms would start January 1st to 24. Commissioners, any questions on the uh, membership? Commissioner Schmidt. So moved. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second, second Commissioner Hensley. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Sorry, Commissioner. Any opposed? Motion carries. Members are approved. Thank you very much. Thank you kindly for your time and consideration. Absolutely. And uh, I think we'll see you at the June meeting uh, with the updates to the, the bylaws. Thank you. All right, moving on. We are uh, complete with the action items component of the meeting. We're going to move on to reports. This is going to be in tab five. Siegel is going to walk us through the financial report um, as they get up here. Um, we're going to go a little bit out of order over the next uh, five items where on the financial report, we will get most of the way through tab five. And I would ask you if you could to stop prior to page 64, which is where we start seeing what would be uh, the section for plan design for 2025. So we can get through the financial report and we will put a pin in this component of it. And we'll move into some of the other discussion item, which would then feed back into um, this. And we can bring you back up here for that. So. Uh, without objection, that's how we're going to move forward, Commission. So please take us away. Uh, hey there, Ken Vieira with Siegel. Um, I know last in February meeting, Patrick Klein went through a lot of the year-end numbers um, and did some projections for 2024, five forward. 
Um, in a nutshell, um, this projection really hasn't changed much. The enrollment was slightly higher, barely higher, which raised the, ex the expense a little bit, it also raised the revenue a little bit. All the ending reserve balances are approximately the same projected for this year. Um, going forward, we're still at the 6.9% rate. So th that being said, um, what we didn't do last time is we didn't roll out the monthly numbers. So with the latest data through February, we rolled out a monthly expectation and that's included. And going forward, we get reconciled to it. So as you go through, obviously year to date is the same number because we just rolled out the, the monthly numbers. So on this page, the only variance is because there was a delayed payment um, for vision administrative expenses. So that'll be paid in March. So year to date, it's a little bit of a gain because that wasn't paid yet, but it comes out in our March number and will be out at the end of the year. All right, next page, Pete, how do I do it? Ah, okay. This is the enrollment data, and you can see obviously we have no variance again, but um, it's slightly higher. I think we had 37,848 um, actives, and it's a little bit higher than that now. And retirees are about the same. Um, interesting to note, which hasn't changed, we've got about 50% of the people that are in the plan, plan A, and then the other 50% approximately are in the the C and N combined, which are the health savings account plans. Did I skip one? No? Okay, I'm on the next page. Um, this is the projected um, revenue and expenses over the next four, five years. Um, the numbers I said are a little bit higher than if you look at last time's on the expenses, only because of the enrollment and the revenue's gone up, but the year on balance that um, the 62.7, that was 62.8 before. Um, so it's, it's pretty much in the same ballpark. So the January and February data really didn't change the numbers um, from what we projected in February. The funding and reserve levels, I mentioned before that we're still at that uh, the same 6.9% level um, and that hits the employer groups on seven one dates and hits the employees on a, a one one date. So it's all the approved changes that you've already made and then going forward to balance out to the end of the period, we're at the 6.9, same, same number we had in February. And then this is again the cumulative impact numbers. If you had higher or lower trends, obviously it it's broadens and broadens and broadens um, and it can cause a substantial variance in your, your cash balance. No different than pretty much what we have projected and we can change this maybe to be plus or minus one percent to make it a little tighter and maybe I'll take you know over a period of time wouldn't show as big a deviation but it's probably be closer to the a, a more typical variance we would expect and then there's just a bunch of the same assumptions that are in the back the next few pages are assumptions and acronyms and then we have the actual model this is where I mentioned that now we're rolling it out by by month and March going forward, we'll start showing that variance so you can see how we're comparing to actuals as they come through. Um, this is a part of the model. Uh, and then these are all the inputs to the model that every, I believe everybody's aware of where you could change all the different component pieces. And I know we've done on the fly modeling before in front of y'all. And then, oops, again, this is where I'm stopping. So I think in general, it's like there's there's nothing surprising. It's it's consistent with what we projected in in February. Um, and like you said, there's going to be some stuff on the plan design that we'll talk about. Um, there's also some follow up in the back about. I know you wanted some benchmarking breakouts. That's we got those in the back as well. Any questions? Thank you for that. Uh, I do have a few questions on page 52, uh, where you have the plus or minus two percent stacked over the, a period of time and what that does. You mentioned you could tighten that up to a, uh, a one point corridor. Yes, sir. Do you have historical, I think I've asked this before, do you have historically how closely we've come in? Could we get a a leading into of, you know, trailing four years uh, of what the trend was projected to be versus where it was? Just a, yeah, we can a plus that. or minus two, this yeah. is helpful for to show how tight we need to be and how far off we can get if we're more than 2% off. 
Uh, but if we can show just a level of confidence coming into you so we have some level of understanding the context what plus or minus two would be yeah we can definitely do that i know um in the last presentation we had a uh, budget the actual variance for the last three years so we had that in the report it was part of the report and that i think over the last three years it was close to zero so it's close to being on which would imply that we're close to the trends so it does vary year to year especially when covid came through things kind of move but yeah we're happy to do that yeah, I think if we can add it to this particular sensitivity analysis graph so we can see, you know, what the trends were coming in. So yeah. is plus or minus 2% even within the realm of possibility or is something really going to have to go bump at the night to get off there? Um, and then moving back a page on page 51, uh, fund balance versus target surplus and shortfall. Uh, looks like we are uh, under current projections looking at falling short of uh, 2025 by 7.9, uh, 14.9 million in 26, and that grows a little bit in 27. Um Obviously, the target is the target. That's where we want to be. But at what point do you start flashing the red lights, so to speak? Um, well, there's two different ones, right? That bottom section is versus the IBNR. So that's the higher level of target. That's what we yeah. traditionally did before a hospital came through and got passed. Gotcha. So okay. the top one doesn't deviate that much. So we're only like 2.6 or, you know. Yeah. Okay. We do get to 10 million in 2027, which is significant. Um, 2027 is a big year because you got an extra claims payment too so it kind of loads up that year a little bit right and then you start to get the impact of the 6.9 because that's kind of delayed you only get a half a year and then you get the full year the following year okay so the top is the target um surplus or shortfall relative to the right. legislative we target talked the about at point. Point. we talked about even maybe even taking off this bottom part because that was just something we did for you know a long time ago we had it in there as a real reserve i believe it's versus. been a couple of years since that legislation passed so i think um you know if you guys need to track that internally i'd be completely happy commission if we're just going to track state law we can track versus legislation that way there's no confusion um any objections to having them remove that seeing none okay, okay. i appreciate what you're trying to accomplish there but let's just you know one yeah. set of numbers here yes, sir okay commission any questions on this component commissioner schmidt Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that's my note on page 51 also, so I appreciate you bringing that up. But also on the report that you've requested, um, I would like to know what the what Siegel projected that we were supposed to go up to, uh, because I believe that every year um, since I have been here, they have projected uh, an increase that for the next year, and um, we have, um, I'll say, set, a, set that aside and have uh, done either uh, we've we've decreased some or we've gone zero. We I don't believe we've increased any of the uh, parameters since um, 2019, maybe 2019. So I, I, what I what I'm trying to get at is that um, uh, I I think that um, they always recommend an increase. We don't do that. We have we, our history would say that we have not done that. Now we have done that on the employ, employer side. Correct. So uh, I should pref, I should have said that originally. Sorry. Okay. We have done on the employer side, but we haven't always done the employer side as much as what they have projected us to do to stay um, to stay above water. And and we have continued to um, at sometimes even build our balance uh, during that. So I'd like to know what they projected us to do. Um, one or two years out, and then what we actually did, and then look at uh, what happened to the balances. Because, um, you know, I look at the 6.9%, and quite frankly, I discount it because um, every year they predicted that we should go. Uh, sometimes it's been in excess of 6.9%, and we haven't done that. So I'd like to know how accurate the projections are. So I want to make sure I'm understanding the request. So you want to look at what the projections for the uh, total increased funding net of employee and employer contributions, what the forecast was and where we were going to be and where we landed. Because we can't just do one without the other. It's a one-legged entry. So having both increases and what the projection was going to be. Okay. And then I believe there was a $10 million infusion into the reserve balance two years ago. So um, at, at the point that the forecast was made prior to that coming in, we'd have to back out the $10 million uh, to show that so just make sure that we're uh, i understand the intent want to make sure that we're not throwing the model off with without taking into account all the variables we need to make sure we right control. i think there was one 10 million dollar infusion but i think that was the only time at, since uh 19 that i recall that i can tell you that was the only time there was a gba or gbr since 2021 so 
Is that something that you guys are able to um, prepare for the June meeting? Yeah, I was pretty much thinking that's what we put in the last report in January because that had year to year to year of the budget versus what we projected. So that yes. was in there, but I guess we could do a longer term one, maybe what it would have been two years out, what we projected with yeah. trends. Um, trends have run lower than, like in that analysis, we showed trends versus assumed versus actual and your medicals run like a percent and a half lower, your pharmacies run a percent and a half lower. So that would create a you know gains as you went forward. So. Yeah, so I, I think if we can have a, I don't know, maybe a three or four year uh, outlook, go back three or four years and do a three or four year trend and, and what we were projecting for the increase to be employee employer combined. Um, and to the extent that there was a variance of their savings uh, or gains, rather, if there's a, a mix analysis or a waterfall chart of some sort that you can show what yeah. each of the components were that led to the variance, that would be helpful. We can do that. Mr. Commissioner Smith. Uh, Commissioner Landwehr. Uh, thank you. Rep Commissioner Landwehr, I got to get used to that. Um, I like having that, that spread out, and I think separating out any infusion that comes from the legislature is important because that money is not always going to be there. And I think it's also important for us to get a clearer picture of uh, why we are running into the deficits. Thank you. Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you. I was wondering on page 54 on the uh, adjustments from RFPs, talks about the PBM RFP and uh, assumed a saving of uh, 20.5 million in 2024 and 30.9 million in 2025. I assume that's due to rebates, um, pricing, and formulary changes, but I want to make sure I understand that. That's correct. Thank you. All right, seeing no further questions, uh, commissioners, we'll have another shot for questions here in a little bit. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So we are going to, as I said, kind of put a pin in five. We are going to come back to that tab in just a little bit, um, but want to move into some of the next couple of uh, discussion topics as they will um, come into play with five. So if we move on to six, there's nothing in your books there. Uh, it's empty. It's just that for plain year 25, uh, and I'll reiterate this again at the end of the meeting. If I don't, somebody please keep me honest. Uh, our next discussion on June 3rd, the June 3rd meeting, is when we will make plan year 25 decisions as a commission. So um, there are going to be some items that are preloaded in here already. Uh, the Seagull is going to walk through when we come back to item five. But if any commissioner has any item that they wish to have for consideration for the June meeting, uh, our request is that you have that information at as specific a level as possible by May 10th. If you can make sure to send those to both Director Flory and myself as we have receipt of that by May 10th, anything that you are uh, looking at changing so we think we can add that to the model. As a reminder, uh, Siegel does have the spreadsheet model that we walk through in real time at the June meeting. Um, so if they have that by May 10th, that'll give uh, my staff team time to work through that and to get something prepared um, and we can have something ready to go and uh, out in advance of the June 3rd meeting. So that's the, the time frame that we're under and May 10th is a Friday. So if we move on to tab seven, I wanted to circle back on this topic. This is the Pans and Pandas report um, that we did submit to the legislature on uh, February 29th. So right at, or you know, a couple hours before the, the final, final deadline, uh, thankfully because we're in a leap year. Um, wanted to make sure that everybody did receive this back in um, February, had uh, time to review it, but wanted to make sure that since this is a report that went to the legislature, there was an opportunity for questions, should there be any. Uh, Siegel is present and able to walk through this if there are any particular questions. Um, as a reminder, the way this is broken out, the first several pages kind of lay out what um, uh, 2022 House Bill 2110 provided for the pilot, uh, what some of the projections were, what some of the plan year 23 finals were, and then behind that in Exhibit C, it has a uh, 2022 House Bill 2110 review, uh, and this is a, a presentation that was provided to the appropriate committee prior to uh, the pilot passing legislation. So this is something that was read by the legislature, if I'm not mistaken, prior to the pilot passing, uh, just as a reference point. Um, I'll go ahead and get ahead of any questions now. The, there was a question about whether or not this should have been included in plan year 24. Uh, I will say again, you know, we do the, the next plan year's uh, meetings and design meetings in June of the year. So given the uh, coverage has started for this program on January 1st, uh, with the claims run out and having a June meeting, there would not have been appropriate time to make a, a decision or determination about, there, there weren't enough uh, claim history 
uh, to really be able to speak to anything at the June meeting. So we did make the determination with SEHP just to cover it into plan year 24, $82,000 worth of claims. What we did not want to do is um, the legislature has next year to make a determination on whether or not to continue this coverage in perpetuity. So what we did not want to do is uh, remove the coverage for plan year 24, only to add it back in plan year 25 should or July 1, 2025 and forward, should the legislature choose to take action. So if there are any concerns on that, please direct those concerns at me. That was my decision and determination. Uh, apologies if anybody in the commission was offended by that. Uh, the intent, again, was just to make sure that we had uh, continuity of, of this coverage and we were able to have a full year of run out before we started talking about what some of the metrics were. So with that, Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I I just believe that the HCC should have been at least had an opportunity to have the discussion. I would clearly have voted for the for it to continue, but I think that not for the HCC is responsible for plan benefit and plan benefit designs. And so I would just ask that next time, if there is a next time, uh, we are um, we are included in that. And I guess I, you know, as may I, as long as we're on the pants panda issue, can I continue? Or, Please continue. Okay. Um, so I know on page 65, um, it, it taught when you, um, it, on the Siegel information, it says terminating pants and pandas coverage and terminating uh, amino acid formula coverage. I don't, I don't, I don't understand that language. Why wouldn't it say inclusion of instead of terminating? Because when we get to plan design, I, I fully, and I'll, I'll make this request um, by May, May, May 10th. Uh, I'll make the request, but I, I want to see those included. I don't want to discontinue the coverage for any of these individuals. I'm just asking that the HCC have a part of that. Yep, fully understand. We're going to get to that discussion when we circle back uh, to that component of the, the meeting. Okay. There, may, there is a, a very valid reason in there, so we'll we'll get to that when we get there. Okay. May I ask questions about the report itself as sure. long as Siegel is here? So um, on page uh, 75, of the report that was submitted. Um, I am really struggling uh, with general surgery claims. Um, I actually uh, went down a deep dark hole, I guess, over the weekend and looked at PANS and PANDAS uh, treatment and um, um, surgery is never listed as a treatment for PANS and PANDAS coverage, yet we paid uh, for, fifth, we had 15 unique members that had general surgery. So was a general surgery really with PANS and PANDAS or was it a secondary surgery relating to PANS and PANDAS? Uh, because general surgery is not, um, uh, it's, it's antibiotics and anti-inflammatories and IVIG. Excuse me, this is Gina Sander with Siegel. Um, I will have to clarify that. With Blue Cross Blue Shield, this is the information that they provided us through your um, specific experience with the codes that they use for this coverage. Well, I know plasmapheresis is, is, a, is one of the um, treatment modalities, yes. but that isn't surgery right? either. So, um, you know, I mean, that may even make our expenses go down, our, our expenses related to PANS and PANDAS um, go down, um, de decrease further. Um, and then I guess I'm um, struggling a little bit with the estimations that you provided uh, on page 80. Um, when this, as I understand, this report was before the legislative body and you estimated the minimal impact and, and then the highest prevalence, you estimated like 211,000 and we were like at uh, 70,000 and you estimated the highest at 704,000. That's really a long way off of what we actually encountered. And I was wondering if you might want to respond to that. So all of this information came from research that we did and it's national prevalence and national treatment costs during this time. Uh, and this was back in 2021, and some of the data was from, you know, 2020. It was it was just a bunch of research that we had found. And uh, when we made the estimate, you'll notice these are based on per treatment cost. And in the report, it talks about the delay in actual treatment and prognosis or diagnosis of these um, symptoms. There 
your coverage of this had only been in place for one year and I don't see any high dollar treatments in here. I think all of the experience that you've had in the last year in 2023 was primarily diagnostic and maintenance type that that claims. isn't true I, I hate to uh i'm sorry to interrupt but that isn't true okay. this was a report you gave to the legislature in 2021 it is so it, it had nothing to do with um what we had experienced thus far this was projections right, right. these projections were based on the cost of treatments and the prevalence counts. And so we took the prevalence, the 0.5 and the 0.15, and applied it to the age group of three to 14 in Kansas's population. Those are the members that would be most likely to be affected by this and applied the, the per treatment costs that we had found in the information but you know clearly not all of those may receive treatment this is an estimate an estimated cost of the treatment per individual you said yeah, Kansas believe, population and it's SEHP population correct SEHP population okay excuse me yes. interjecting real quick with a question I believe when you say there the high cost has not hit Kansas yet you mean for plan year 20 three for 23 which is what could have led to the discrepancy which is why it's so much lower than what you're seeing here so is it fair to say that the 200 and whatever thousand that was in the legislative study from a couple of years ago would be a a fully mature plan and not the first year of implementation and i think that would be fair to say because that was based on treatment costs okay. yes do you have any um do we have Okay, we wouldn't have that yet then. So that was 2023. So we're only in 2024 plan year or only three months, three months in. So maybe at the midpoint, we could get a um, uh, true number. An updated figure, yes. An updated. Uh, yeah, my expectation would be that by the June meeting, we'll have the most current information possible. Again, recognizing that, especially with IBNR, we're not going to have a full five months of data, but whatever data we have available, we should have within the packet before the June meeting. Okay. And um, lastly, Mr. Chairman, um, I was wondering, I, I would like um, my letter to at least be included in some um, some form in, in the um, packet, in the minutes. If you don't want to, you can tell me. <laughs> I would prefer not to, um, quite candidly. Uh, if there is still a, a dissent position after reviewing this information, I'd be happy to have that conversation. But given that was um, submitted in official record to the Senate president, the Speaker of the House, I think it, it has a permanent home and it has a permanent record. Uh, I would also take objection to some of the uh, comments that were put in there or some of the um, copy and paste from my comments that left some of the other comments out of there. So I'd want a chance to discuss that with you prior to putting this in here. I think there's more that can be done there to make it a more accurate representation of what it is and, and what some of the comments were. I welcome that conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Landwehr. Mr. Landwehr here. I guess this kind of raises the question of the fact that we use the state employee plan to test out any potential insurance mandates the legislature might consider. And what I'm hearing with this experience is that you're basically telling us that a one year experience is not enough. The legislation should have been for two years in order to give us a full impact study. Would that be accurate? I believe my comments were that at the June 2023 meeting, when we were discussing plan year 24, we would not have nearly enough claims experience to make an informed decision whether or not to cancel or excuse me, suspend the coverage at the end of the 2023 year. So it was my determination as secretary of administration leading the SEHP team that we should just leave that in for another year. Um, with, so we're not going back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I think the legislature and the report that we're submitting here does have a full year of fully run out claims history and, and the experience in it. So the legislature could take that information and make a determination. Um, the legislation did say that the legislature would not take that up until the year following the report. So that would be the next legislative session. And clearly we'll have a lot more claims experience 
given the fact that we're covering it in 2024 as well. So I think it'll be a more informed decision for the legislature at that point. So if they don't take it up until 25, then it would be your intentions that you have the authority to authorize this through 24 and 25? I think now that we have a, a, a full year of run out to review, the HCC is clearly in a position to have the data available to us to determine whether or not we want to continue this in 25, which is what we'll get to in the next section. I'll, I'll just I voice my opinion here a little bit is that I just felt like the statute was clear. The, the program was supposed to end at the end of December and there could have been a meeting called for us to make a decision to continue it, continue it, and I just thought it was wrong for one individual to make that decision. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner Schmidt. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would agree with Representative Lenware that I think that pilot program statute needs some updating because I do believe it puts um, the HCC, the SEHP, and the legislature in, in kind of an awkward position because you don't have the claims data in by the time you're trying to decide for the next, the next year. Now, I, I understand there could be times when um, those are I, mean, I, I can think of scenarios where those could be astronomical on amounts and, and then we might have to go back and, and, you know, we could go back and visit with the legislature and visit with how how, um, how that uh, played out. But I do believe, um, and, and I, I believe that in, as a legislator, when we did the autism um, te, uh, pilot program through the SEHP, that um, we, the time the timing is just not it's not awkward it doesn't flow it's just awkward and it doesn't flow and so i think that the legislature uh should take a look at at those statutes representative commissioner commissioner representative whatever your uh, title is right now uh brenda landwehr uh, i think you ought to look at those and and uh i think you know m maybe with uh the hcc and and staff we could help them make a better um, a, a, a one that is more um, friendly to rolling out. Very good. Appreciate the input. I, I don't think there's any disagreement uh, around the table, at least none that I've heard, that uh, the timing is not conducive to making uh, informed decisions uh, with the level of information you would have at the time that you have it. Um, why don't we take this action and for the August, September, whatever the Two meetings from now, a meeting would be we can have a dis discussion on uh, if the HCC wants to make a proposal to the legislature to make any updates to that. And let's not get bogged down with that today and the procedure there, but certainly uh, worth having that discussion to make sure that we're giving our legislative partners all the information they need to make informed decisions. I think they would appreciate that. Any other comments, questions on the Pans and Pandas report? All right, here, oh, Commissioner Deccan. Just that I don't think there was any other good decision to be made, but but to continue it. I mean, we started something, and apparently there were whatever hitches. Uh, but I think that it was responsible, reasonable, and the right thing to do to continue it through this year. And then I think it sounds like we'll have an opportunity as this body to weigh in towards the end of this year about 25, yeah. because we're going to run into the same thing. We're going to run into the uh, Legislatures not having the the data from 23 and 4 to review until after 24 ceases to exist, and either we choose to drop it and leave those people wherever they're at, or we choose to, and again we'll we'll be discussing this, but we're going to have the same kind of thing happen, even if we as a body have an opportunity to weigh in, we'll still have the same kind of decisions to make that that were made independently earlier this year or late last. That's it. Very good. Thank you. All right, seeing nothing else, we're going to move on to uh, agenda topic number eight, which is a, a discussion only. Uh, talking about residential treatment. Uh, so this is in tab eight on your books. Um, just a couple of slides here, uh, three total slides, I believe. There was questions raised uh, at the last meeting on February 16th uh, about residential treatment uh, facilities, and there was a um, determination made back in 2020 uh, to make sure that the state employee health plan was compliant with uh, mental health parity. So the request was to go back and, and do some digging on uh, who was involved in the decision, um, what decision points, excuse me, what data was in there to drive the decision, how, how the decision became informed. Um, and there were some questions about what level of um, benefit might have been taken away from state employees. So I'll start on page 94 here. 
the question is, uh, as was submitted um, to State Employee Health Plan and myself uh, about the market study um, and how the decision was made. So as you can see in the blue comments there, CMS did in fact conduct a market study between 2018 and 2022. So thinking back to the time frame, then that would have been the at the start of that. <clears throat> pardon me, is when State Employee Health uh, Plan was in KDHE, and then towards the end of that, they would have transitioned over to Department of Administration. These discussions involve staff from CMS, Secretary of Administration, um, State Employee uh, Health Plan Legal Counsel, both from KDHE and from DFA. Started with KDHE again, uh, and then I think when the decision or determination was finally made, it had landed at the DFA. Uh, SEHP staff, Siegel, and the TPAs were involved with, with that as well. So what had happened is CMS reviewed the plan's coverage, uh, which included swing bed coverage, and determined this to be residential treatment. Uh, the plan was not required to cover residential treatment for mental health or SUD unless it does provide the uh, coverage for medical services like swing bed coverage. What that means is absent some level of change, either including mental health and SUD residential treatment or eliminating the swing bed, uh, the plan would have been deemed to be out of compliant with mental health parity. So the state employee health plan reviewed the utilization uh, for both 2018 and 2019 and identified that there were zero claims paid uh, for skilled nursing swing beds in 2018 and 2019. Uh, so discussions uh, with the parties listed above ensued and determined that because no claims had been paid by eliminating that, we were not removing a benefit that was actively being utilized by members and it did in fact help us become compliant. Uh, plan in the year 2019 was a final year swing bed coverage. And from that point forward in 2020, CMS did deems SEHP uh, to be compliant with mental health parity. Um, I wanna clarify, there was a, I don't know if it was a comment or a question during the last meeting about uh, eliminating uh, rehab um, from uh, state employee health benefits. And that's, it's not entirely what happened. So again, this is just swing beds. So swing beds meaning a, skilled nursing resident, excuse me, rehab type, mostly in a rural setting where there's not a residential uh, rehab facility available. So if, for example, uh, if a state employee were to need to go to Kansas rehab facility as a provider here in town and uh, receive, be, um, be admitted on an inpatient basis, they are licensed as an inpatient acute facility. They do get coverage. This determination did not change any of that. So rehab is still covered in that setting. So the, this determination did not change anything on that level. Um, there are some rehab facilities that are uh, longer term facilities. Um, I think some of the the, BI, the brain injury waiver facilities, maybe a Madonna out of Nebraska or a Craig out of Denver, that um, today the medical components and all the uh, outpatient, the, any of the medical components are covered. The residential stays, the room and board is not covered. That was true prior to this decision and that is true today as well. So stated differently, this determination that was made back in 2020 had no impact on the, um, the coverage for residential inpatient for those facilities. This did not have any of those unintended consequences. So I wanna make sure that we clarified that, again, whether it was a question or a statement that came up during the last meeting. There were a few other questions on page 95 you can see there. Uh, how is the decision to update the benefit plan description communicated? Uh, anytime federal law or state law changes um, there or changes made by the HCC, uh, the benefit description is communicated. Uh, we meet with the TPAs, uh, Department of Administration Legal, who is counsel for the HCC uh, and the HC SEHP consultant, and we discuss the language and the updates and changes that are going to be necessary. These documents are provided to members and they are posted on the SEHP website, so there's ample opportunity for folks to see the new benefits uh, description. How often is this reviewed and updated? The benefit description is reviewed annually and required updates are done annually as well. And do, does SCHP work with outside counsel? Uh, the answer is kind of, yes. We start with uh, primarily DFA counsel because again, that is the counsel for um, HCC. When needed, we do consult with the TPAs and uh, cons um, our consultants counsels as well as Siegel's counsel. So we do bring in outside counsel uh, with DFA having sort of the final determination. Um, so that is sort of the history um, as it was. We've been able to, to go through and find again, um, as it relates to you know, inpatient acute care settings, rehab, none of those benefits were taken away from our employees. Uh, as it relates to the residential inpatient being uh, not a covered service as some of those longer term care facilities, that's been a policy for a number of years, uh, which was prior to uh, this determination that was made back in 2020. Uh, so this was made, again, making sure that we were in compliance. 
I will say that, you know, back then, 2018, 2019, uh, likely in a different market or landscape anyway, as it relates to what is covered and what's not covered. Um, so I would say that given the information that was available at the time and at the time that uh, this decision was made, it appeared to be one that was well-intended and did not uh, have an impact on anybody. Certainly for the prior two years, there were no claims in that, that arena. Uh, does not mean that it's still the right decision. It just means that at that point in time, you know, it was a different landscape as it relates to residential treatment, uh, room aboard coverage. Um, so that is sort of the background that we were asked to go through and look for. Are any questions on this before we move into um, a little bit deeper discussion on this? Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to preface my remarks by I respect you immensely, and I, I do respect the decisions that you make most of the time. <laughs> I, I and, and you weren't around Correct. when these decisions were made, but I don't understand that if, for example, on, I don't remember what page it is, but the page that has like the, um, the pos from Siegel about the possibilities of like orthodontia and, and uh, all the other things, those are changes in benefits. Those, those are changes in benefits. And, and, you, and we do that at the HCC when we, when we talk about benefit design and we talk in June, what, what we're gonna hopefully do in June about what do we wanna add? What do, what do we wanna, do we wanna change anything? I don't understand how a major decision like this could be made because to me this is major because ment I I believe that the uh, that the state employee health plan is the outlier 100% I believe that we are the outlier in not coming covering room and board for SUD and I and I, so I don't understand. So it makes me it makes me want to know what other decisions does SEHP make for benefit design that HCC never even hears about. What how how does that work? Because I firmly believe that HCC should have been consulted at this juncture for this because we have been sued for parity. We we have had um, that's not a secret to anybody anyway so i i um i also want, wanted to know on the um on the um the, was does the SEHP consult with outside counsel when you say consultants counsel is that siegel on page uh 95 on the last um is consultants counsel siegel Yes. So uh, again, work with the TPA uh, council and as necessary to make sure that we're in line there and we're not misinterpreting. But yeah, a consultant would be Siegel in this instance as the actuary. And then how many times in the past year have we consulted with Blue Cross Blue Shield and Aetna with the TPAs on plan design, on, on, on benefit changes? I mean, is it, does that occur monthly? Does that occur once a year? When, do we, when, when does SEHP consult with the TPA on plan design? Yep. So I, I don't have the answer off the top of my head. That's not one of the, the questions that was submitted in, in a specific format. Uh, I would say specifically or certainly, you know, if we make any plan design changes at the June meeting, that's something that we should be looking to them for and, and making sure that we understand what the implications are across there. Um, absent any plan designs and the ver changes in the first three or four months of this month, I have not had any meetings with them about that. There has not been a need, uh, nor have they come to me with any concerns. Okay. And then... Um, maybe not directly related to this, but somewhat related to plan design. Um, it has come to my attention that um, uh, there are different, I mean, as, as I would expect there would be, there, there are different coverages, but Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas does not cover the exact same thing as Aetna and vice versa. They, they are different plans. They have different plan documents. They file different plan documents. Um, I, I would be interested, has um, it, has anybody ever looked at that? And because I think our employees might choose a different plan if they had the information. But when when we look through the document, the the, the plan document that we send out to all the employees, we don't say like this. This is covered in this plan. But if you ha if you have this disease state, you might want to look at this plan because it, you might want to look at the other carrier because it covers um, more of, of that. I mean, I, have we ever done a planned side-by-side -side comparison of coverages? 
So I might uh, look to Director Flory to walk us through what the plan design and, and documents have. I think there is a, a high level of consistency across the two, so I, but I want to make correct. sure I'm not getting off track here. Yep, that's correct. So we have a base benefit document, and then to that document, there's a schedule. And the base benefit document is discussed with both Aetna and Blue Cross and Blue Shield on an annual basis, and it is the same document. There are some places within that document, such as things that are specific to that vendor that they customize in the final document that go out, such as things like appeal processes, mailing addresses, but this, the base document is the same for plans A, C, J and N. The schedule is separate and so that is a separate piece that we modify for those particular plans to show the different coinsurance levels, different deductibles and there is a slight benefit difference between plan A and C, J and N. Because C and N are qualified high deductible health plans um, there are certain things that, that we're not allowed to do. So, for instance, I believe allergy treatments are um, available under Plan A, and you don't have to meet the deductible. They're under the preventive benefit, but under C and N, we couldn't do that because they're not highlighted within the qualified high deductible eligibility statutes. So, there's some slight one or two in that right, Paul, differences between A and C, J, and N as far as plan coverage, um, but they're pretty minor. Otherwise, the document is the same document. We just modify it to add the, the specific things that we need to to be in compliance. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm not talking about between A, C, and N. I'm talking about plan A only. And unfortunately, I have firsthand experience in the treatment of breast cancer, and Aetna and Blue Cross Blue Shield are different in what they cover in the treatment. And I think that is important to know. I can only tell you about that particular one, but if the plan document says you have to cover breast cancer treatment, I can tell you that um, it is not specific enough because there are plan differences. So I'm, that's what I'm asking. Are, so I think, it ought, I think it ought to be delineated out. If you have breast cancer, this will not be covered on this plan, but it's gonna be covered on this plan. And, and those aren't, to me, those aren't minor differences. Those are big differences. Okay, noted. Um, why don't we take the action item to look at the uh, plan documents for uh, the two carriers? and see what the differences might be in coverage. And uh, if you have specific examples that you can provide to staff of what was and was not covered, that would be greatly helpful to point us in the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I um, I wish I didn't have that firsthand experience, but since I do, I'm gonna use it. Um, We're happy that you got the coverage that you did. Well, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Fair enough. Um, but on the residential treatment follow-up, um, I, I know this is a discussion item only today, um, or that's what you, your your preference is. Uh, I can understand that, but I absolutely think that we are doing a disservice to our state employees by not covering room and board for SUD, and I feel very, very strongly about that with the, um, uh, the state of everything now. Uh, I, I think it's unconscionable for us not to cover that. And so um, I, I know um, I, I know also that on that's on the Siegel page of things, but I, I would um, on each one of those, I'd like to know a little bit more about how, and I can do that one-on-one -on -one with Siegel or if anybody, maybe no one else is interested in that, but I wanna see how they came up with the figures of like $2.1 million to cover that. Um, I think we'll we'll get in that discussion at, at the very next time we turn the page. So we're as I said for action item five we're going to come back or discussion item five, five we're going to come back okay. to that and start talking about the financials and what's in there and what the next steps are going to be and how we're going to do that going forward. So okay. if there's no other discussions on this particular right. component, why don't we move sure. back to uh, Commissioner Deccan? Um, 
you commented on the 18 and 19 data that was had, uh, no claims were made. That race route, do, do we know whether there have been any queries since that time by anybody saying, am I covered? Uh, I doubt that there's data, so it'd be more um, stored. It's escaping me now, just about people remembering, but I'm, I'm just curious if, if there have been any queries to SEHP about about the if swing bed this, specifically? Are you talking about the swing bed coverage? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Um, certainly, there's something we can go back and look, see if there was any denied claims for swing bed coverage. Um, but I don't believe the staff has gotten any calls on swing bed coverage or lack thereof. Uh, but certainly, something we can go back and, and review. So. And, and the thought came on my mind as you made the comment at the time it was the right decision. Maybe maybe things have changed since then, and, and maybe it's something we ought to look at. Yep, uh, and I would agree, and, I, and Commissioner Schmidt, I, I think you and I are very closely aligned as it relates to uh, mental health coverage and making sure that we're uh, taking care of that, whether it's, um, you know, you know my feelings on Medicaid expansion, not to get into a different uh, discussion, but uh, for state employees as well. Um, the fact that we are an outlier is uh, we, we shouldn't be. I think if you would rewind the clock six years, I don't know that we would be an outlier in the discussions that I've had with TPA Brass uh, as it relates to these conversations that Yes, uh, there is coverage now. No, there probably wasn't the level of coverage several years ago. So again, my comments on this were taking us back to the time at which the decisions were made. There was a different landscape. Today is a new landscape. So I just want to make sure we focus all of our effort and all of our energy around doing what's right from 2024 going forward. And that's that's where I'm coming at this from. So if we can move back to uh, tab five, um, I believe we stopped at page 63 was the last page, maybe. As you're coming up, I'll, I'll just go to page 64. Um, so this is the file, uh, printout of the file that was used last time as we made plan design changes. This is where we look at what the employee uh, an increase for contribution might be on a percentage basis. The employer, both for state, non-state, not Medicare retiree. Um, at the last meeting, we obviously made the, uh, the ter determination that we would not increase employee contributions for 2024. I believe the motion was also for 2025. Uh, and then you can see what the out years would be with the current forecast. So that, that will be the page that we look at uh, going forward. If you move to page 65. Chairman, okay, what page is this where? chart on? What page is this chart on? 64, which is in tab five. Oh, you went back. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, but if we move forward to page 65, I want to make sure we set the table for this. And I need Siegel to keep me uh, honest if I get off track here. This is the the tab table that we're going to show or the pages that we'll show. So as you have requests for items to review uh, the financials for what it would be to cover, increase coverage, reduce coverage, anything, we'll have a table that looks like this for each of those requests. And that's why we need the information by May 10th. So if I start at the very top um, section there, the legislative pilot programs, terminating PANS and PANDAS coverage, uh, you can see across 25, 26, 27, 28, what this means is if we took that action to terminate PANS and PANDAS coverage, the numbers across there would be the impact to the cost of the plan. Meaning if we terminated PANS and PANDAS coverage for plan year 25, the cost of the plan would go down by $210,000 in 25, 222,000 in 26, 234,000 in 27, and 247,000 in 28. Let me be crystal clear, this is not the recommendation. This is because we left PANS and PANDAS in for plan year 24, should the HCC choose to make a different uh, choice for 25, the other choice would be to remove it and you would be saving this level of money. So by having it on here, we are not suggesting that we should remove PANS and PANDAS. It's just a, a level of the impact if you made that change. Same with terminating amino acids formula coverage. Uh, the next section down is dental benefits. Uh, we had some discussion, I believe at the last meeting on orthodontic lifetime max. So there's a series of um, different options there and what the cost would be should we choose to increase the lifetime benefit. Uh, residential treatment, all plans. So this here is including room and board benefits to current coverage, adds residential treatment for mental health and for medical health. So for some of those facilities that I talked about, uh, maybe the longer term rehab facilities that both 10 years ago, five years ago and today, we don't provide residential uh, room and board. If we determined that we were going to include those, there would be a fiscal impact associated with that. I wanna come back to that one. Moving down, if we increase the deductibles, what would the impact be on the plan? And again, a negative number means the cost would go down, a positive number means the cost would go up to the plan. 
as we make all of these decisions, you know, we'll have yes, no, and it's going to roll back to the front page and we'll see what the employee and employer contribution might be in the out years. And then we can see what the impact on the reserve is. So we can make an informed decision in June with all of the plan design changes that would go into effect for plan year 25. So we can see the cumulative effect of all of the changes that the commission wants to make. That way we're not doing one-offs throughout the year and just looking at partial fiscal impacts. That's the intent of the June meeting and to make sure that we have everything on one page. If I can go back to residential treatment, all plans on this page, and again, it's the third blue box down. I believe the numbers on here are, are not accurate and need to be updated and should be updated for June. So if you can walk us through uh, what we're looking at here and what we might be looking at in the future, if you have that information. Yeah, I believe right now these are rate manual related numbers. Um, but we have been getting clarifications from Blue Cross and that and, uh, of your own experience and their book of business experience, and we're we're going to adjust the numbers to be more in sync with their local experience, um, which has more of their contract rates and everything that who they're contracted with. So I believe the number will be approximately about half of what this number is here. So it'll, it'll become it'll get lower, less of an impact. That would be to include mental health, ACD, and the medical side as well. That's correct. Okay. So the numbers are overstated by about double right now. So uh, we'll need to make sure we firm those up and, and have a high level of confidence in the numbers that they walk in on June. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Lamware. Is it also possible to, on that, is to get a breakdown of, because we know the limitations we have on inpatient beds in Kansas is in-state, versus out of state and then where these services are being provided, what facilities? You know, yeah, I believe that Blue Cross should be able to tell us for their network as well as that, you know, how much is in, in state versus out of state and their normal book of business and the similar network. And it would break it down by facility. They should I just be don't know how many down. I don't know how many inpatient facilities Kansas has available. They should be able to break down their experience and tell us the split throughout the state of their book of business that covers that benefit right now. Who the facility is. I don't see why they couldn't. It's their book of business. So, yeah, I would think so. But I mean, we that we would know this by now. <laughs> Director Flory. We will simply ask Blue Cross if they can provide us the, the names of the in-state facilities. I don't know on the out-of-state how complete that might be because there are, there are many residential treatment providers outside of the state of Kansas and our employees may not be using like those on the East Coast probably are not going to be frequently used by our members. But we can certainly um, get the in-state and see what we can get on the out-of-state and they probably are with our surrounding states. Right. Yes. That's we what I'm so. looking for. I'm not looking for the east or the west coast. Okay. Now, if there's something like that happening, then we probably need to know because those costs would obviously be umpteen higher than what we're dealing with here in the Midwest. But we do know that there's facilities that individuals are going to that are outside of Kansas. It'll also give us as a state the idea of what it is that we need to actually do and not. And to clarify, and, and Director Floria, please bump me on track. Bump me on track if I get off track. As it relates to um, some of these services today, we do, with qualified uh, provider types, licensed provider types, we will pay for the uh, medical components or the treatment components as the residential inpatient room and board that does not get covered. So I just want to make sure we're there. So if we do move to um, covering this uh, room and board for residential treatment facilities, as I understand it, these are global billing and global payments that happen, so it's not going to be parsed out between the provider and the um, inpatient. That's going to vary it, um, somewhat because some facilities today do use a global fee because they have in-house providers that right. they may be using that are counselors. Other facilities may strictly be using licensed professionals who bill separately. Um, we do pay those separate bills today, and so potentially we could be picking up some provider costs in the global fees for those that don't today, um, but we still may have individual providers out of state that are billing us directly separate from the room and board of the facility. Okay. I guess, Mr. Chairman, then the question is, is there a difference in 
the terminology of residential versus an inpatient in a hospital. And um, Commissioner Lamware, this is Jennifer. And yes, there is. It's based upon when you look at the definitions and how the facilities are licensed. So inpatient facilities today have um, acute licenses. And so we are covering the Rehman Board there today. Um, in the residential facilities, they have a different license and we are not paying that room and board charge. If they're using skilled um, licensed professionals and they will bill us separately, we do pay those mental health services, which could include you know, group therapy, individual therapy. There's um, different, different things that they may be getting. Um, for facilities, though, however, that may use a component of counselors, like a drug counselor or a, a pastoral counselor, they are not licensed, and so they don't bill separately. They bill under the facility as a global fee. Does that help? So, well, it, it, does, it does help, because it leads me to where I'm headed, is that there is a difference between inpatient with acute care and then residential facilities. So I think that in order for the board to make a clear decision, we need to understand what do those definitions include? Who, that, who do they include? And who do they exclude? Correct, and, and I, I believe that's gonna, be, that's gonna be part of the uh, materials that will be presented at the June meetings to make sure that we have a, a very clear understanding because this is, uh, the, the words matter uh, with this. So Commissioner Schmidt. Yes, I, I just wanted to add that usually uh, it's my understanding that when a um, we do have mental health inpatient centers um, and, and that is and the room and board is covered because that is a, usually there's a, a different medical component um, associated with that. And then um, many times, um, not all the time, but many times um, you step down into, so to speak, you go from the inpatient hospitalization, you step down to a residential treatment center. And then that's when we don't pay the, that's when we're currently not paying that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask, I know that um, I can think of uh, one time anyway, where the, the commission um, decided to start covering the services in, in mid, middle of a year of a plan year and didn't wait. So um, I'm not, I'm not, I, I I know we're not at that discussion point now, but what I would like to know is, um, would it be possible to, if the commission, I don't, I know I'm part of the commission, but if the commission were to decide to, uh, they wanted um, more immediate coverage than to wait until January of 2025 for um, this particular item, um, I, I know we've worked with our, partners before at Aetna and Blue Cross, our TPAs, to, to make that happen? And um, would that be a possibility if the, if like if we wanted a September 1st start date or something like that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I, you, you didn't ask for this, but I, my, my intent is to have all plan design discussions at the June meeting, none of them today. I know you didn't ask for that, just wanna make sure I'm clear. Um, my initial intent is to try to keep everything as clean as humanly possible. Uh, we do everything on a plan year basis. Um, so the, the goal is to have everything start on a Jan 1 start date with a plan year. I mean, that's, that's standard practice. It's protocol. It keeps every clean, everything clean, uh, and it keeps, um, it, it mitigates confusion and, um, some of the, the things that could happen when you start adding different mid-year changes. Is it possible to do a quote mid-year change or partial year change? Yes, but there are notice requirements that we'd have to adhere to. So we'd have to make the determination. We'd have to stick to the notice requirement. We'd have to scramble to make sure that we get the communication out. We need to make sure that everybody's up to speed. Um, so you're you're buying maybe a three-month window of doing that at the risk of potentially missing something along the way. So you have to weigh the pros and cons. Uh, what I don't want to do is say we're going to start a coverage on make a number up September 3rd and that person goes for treatment and then there's a, a headache there and it, it doesn't happen as, as planned. So I, we didn't weigh the pros and cons. It, is it possible? Yes. I do not believe it'd be possible for us to adjust member rates. Uh, if it is possible, I wouldn't want to adjust member rates. Um, so the, the full freight of that cost would be borne by the state. So, you know, we do have a dual mandate for providing the best possible coverage for our employees while also managing the state's pocketbook. So that's, those are the considerations we'll have to take into account. Any other questions or discussion? 
Commissioner Deccan. On the uh, Plan C section of uh, page 65. It's your mic on. I don't have a sign that says turn your mic on. <laughs> Probably wouldn't do any good. Um, thank you. When do we find out from the feds what uh, what requirements for a qualified high deductible might apply? And I'm, I'm my eyes fall on the uh, increasing the the deductibles. Uh, we've increased those for, for a number of years, not because we really chose to, but it was a it was a mandate. When do we find that out? It usually is announced by the IRS sometime over the summer, and you're correct. We, we've kept the total, the, the family deductible the same, but for family contracts, because of, of changes the IRS has made, we've had to increase that um, first deductible on a family contract to meet the requirements. And I think it's, is it July that we've seen them typically? Yeah, so there's usually a, there's around a July. fair likelihood that in June we won't know what what mandate there is for in that regards, and we'll just have to deal with it when it comes. That's correct, and I think we've had to make that adjustment um, then posthumously in, in in August at the August meeting, but it's a compliance situation, so it's a little different. I was mainly just if if I was thinking right, I wanted to draw that to our attention. That it would be an element that would be out there and we have no control over it. Any other comments, questions? Commissioner Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the additional information from uh, Siegel on the overall plan richness for employee plus spouse and employee plus children. Commissioner, um, are you in the appendix for follow up materials? I'm sorry, what? Are you in the appendix for follow up materials? Well, I'm. Um, Where are you? It's in reference to. Um, on page 65 to the drug coverage. Okay. Okay, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, I just wanna make sure I'm on the okay. right page. So I, I'm on, yeah, I, I'm back on 103 and 102 and stuff, but you know, I mean, I, I know our, our um, I was a little stunned at how um, our, I, I know it can be uh, small percentage points, but um, our plan A isn't um, as rich as some of our neighbors, so to speak. But when I look at page 104, Five and I think 106, and I look at the um, our re the regional plans. How Kansas compares to Nebraska, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Colorado and Iowa. Our drug plans, our our drug copays are significantly higher than any of our surrounding states, and um, I that that does bother me a tad. Um, I, I think. Um, you know, we have, well, I just, I just would, um, I'll be submitting some questions possibly, oh, I will be on uh, uh, decreasing some of those co-pays and seeing what that does to the, uh, to the um, numbers. But I, I mean, you know, we, we're at a significantly, we're at 20% co-insurance, which is a lot different than a $5 copay, a $10 copay, $14 copay, 20 or $20 copay. You know, 20% uh, co-insurance is um, a lot more than a set copay. And on, on preferred brand drugs, we're really, um, our, our employees are paying much, much more than they would in surrounding states. And I, I I wonder if that, I, I know that would contribute to the richness of our plan. I don't know how much, but I know it would contribute to the richness of our plan. So just wanted to make that notation. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And you had gotten ahead of me into tab nine. So that's all right. We're good. It was a, a good way to move us forward. Any other questions or comments? All righty. So there, that was the, since we're there, the follow-up materials uh, on tab nine, appendix A. There was a few questions about uh, HealthQuest Center utilization. You can review the data there. Uh, and then obviously the uh, benchmark follow-up and the plan richness uh, that we just discussed. So if there's any questions there, uh, feel free to let us know or if you need to after the fact. Uh, sure. Yes, sir. Commissioner Deccan. Uh, when I looked at those. Which page we... are you on? Yes, it is. No, probably, which page probably, are you on? Oh, I'm sorry, 105. Same things that Commissioner Schmidt was, was referring to. When I looked at those, the question I had was, how does a percentage coinsurance compare 
to a five dollar or fourteen or whatever it is, can we can we calculate on an average at least what our twenty percent coinsurance is in dollars versus percentage? In other words, how can we, you made the statement? I, I have nothing to say. You're correct or spot on or whatever. But we can how does work. It compare? We can work with Caremark to try to to do some modeling to see if we can come up with that. You know, our plan is a transparent pharmacy program with point of sale rebates, which come into play when a member purchases particularly a brand drug that would have a rebate that's applied at the point of sale reducing the dollar amount before the coinsurance is applied which is a very progressive program which i can tell you many of states would be very pleased to have but it but it is different it is very different from a coinsurance or for a copay flat copay amount so we can see if we can work with caremark and their team to do some modeling on that. Um, another thing that potentially the commission could look at if they're interested would be on our high deductible health plan, we don't, all of our drugs are subject to the deductible today, but there is a preventive drug list that is allowed that a qualified plan could have and those drugs would either have could have a lower deductible or they could have no deductible and just have the coinsurance applied. So um, there are some options we can look at within that. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I don't understand what was just said about, so the, the rebate is applied before the coinsurance? Yes. How is that transparent if that's what is occurring? How, do, how does a consumer know what rebate you got before you got the 35% coinsurance hit? So it's transparent in that if I am taking a drug that costs $100 and there's a $20 rebate, that $20 rebate is applied at the point of sale, reducing the amount that I have to pay out of pocket. So both the state and the member benefit from that rebate at the point of sale. And then the coinsurance is applied, both sharing at that lower rate, as opposed to what most states do, which is instead they take that hundred dollars and they apply the copay to it and then six eight months down the line a check for the rebate comes and is put into the health plan account so it's transparent in that the rebates that the member is actually earning with their purchase are actually applied to their purchase and they benefit from them so is that to say that it, in the example of a hundred dollar medication if there's a twenty dollar rebate as opposed to paying the co-insurance on a hundred dollars Coinsurance is reduced off of $80 instead of the $100, as opposed to paying the full freight of the coinsurance on 100, and then waiting for a rebate check to come back into the state to be deposited there. Right, and the member doesn't actually directly benefit from that rebate check that comes Correct. back to the state. But they do get the benefit of the reduced base upon which the coinsurance is is placed. If we didn't have point of sale rebates, then the money would be coming back to the state to be deposited. The way we work it today, it's applied at the point of sale. And then we do do a true up at the end of the year, but so if there are any rebates that actuals are different from the estimates, then those dollars do go into the state fund as part of, of the um, income in the account. But if you are a copay plan, then the entire rebate amount goes into the plan and is shared with everybody covered under the plan as opposed to the member who actually generated the rebate. Very good. Commissioner Schmidt. Well, I think what I'm talking about, the transparency of the patient. I mean, this is a big complaint about PBMs, right? It's the T word, the transparency word. So the patient that is picking up the prescription never knows about the $20 rebate that they got before their coinsurance. I don't, I don't ever see that on a receipt. And, and that's that is entirely possible. And as the rebates do change, um, we hear from employees when, particularly as a drug starts to go, is going to go off of patent and those rebate dollars start to decrease, then they will see that their rebate dollars reduced and their costs go up. But yes, you are correct on a receipt. It is not going to show you that you benefited from that rebate. I, I guess I, I kind of have a, I, I do have a problem um, with that um, because. What would be the recommendation, Commissioner? Well, to make the receipt show that the 
the trans the the receipt to the patient ought to show the transparency of what the rebate was. Do we have the authority to to I would assume so, but I I don't know do we that we have that? the ability to do that because you're talking about receipts that are generated at a pharmacy and there are many pharmacies and they don't all use the same systems and I don't know we can they uh, still all use point we, of sale. Yep. Yeah. Why don't we take that as a follow up item? Um, I, I can't Thank commit you. to an answer by June, but yeah, I, uh, point well taken. Um, I, I would anticipate seeing, you know, all the puts and takes on a receipt of what led to the costing. So uh, let us determine what options are available to us. And then from there, we can determine what the best course of action is. Mr. Chairman. Ma'am. Commissioner Lamer. And, and I could see some of the complexity with the receipts, but where do we see it then in our financials? So we do... Uh, on an annual basis, a true up with Caremark, and we get the total dollars that they've paid out in rebates, the total dollars that were earned, and any difference between those dollars is given to us in the form of a check, and it shows up then in the in the Siegel financials. Is that broken out as a separate line item? I'm sorry. Is that broken out as a separate line item on the financials with the rebates? I'm seeing the head shaking. Can. Can you on the microphone, please? Yeah. We have them separate. I think I think they're combined into the pharmacy line, but we can we can break them out. If we can break them out, I think that'd be helpful uh, for us at least see where the rebates are, and especially if we start building the history, what they are over time, if they're going up or going down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, commissioners, we are 19 minutes over. Before we hit 20, are there any other last items? Okay, so as a reminder, uh, next meeting is gonna be um, June 3rd. So we need, uh, by May 10th, any requests for anything you would like Siegel to model for potential plan year 25 design changes. We'll make sure that we have uh, all the wording and the appropriate levels of care broken out as it relates to residential treatment. Uh, we will have a good robust discussion then if there are any comments or questions or uh, requests for improvements uh, in advance of the next meeting uh, with levels of specificity that will help us drive to a good resolution. Please provide those well in advance. Um, I also do want to thank staff uh, for all the time that they put into this. I know you work incredibly hard. I do a lot of work on the back end, uh, a lot of which we do not see. So I appreciate you uh, coming prepared and getting all of us prepared and being able to answer all of our questions. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned.